Um, my title for Peter, In God's Kingdom, Nobody is a Nobody. In God's Kingdom, Nobody's a Nobody. Now, if King Charles decided one day to visit Pocklington, and why wouldn't he? Pocklington is lovely, is it not? It's the most beautiful town in East Yorkshire. Or is it, shall I say, Yorkshire? Well, I'm exaggerating a bit now. I mean, York might get in there. Harrogate might have a word to say. Anyway, you know what I mean. It's a lovely place to live. It's one of the prettiest towns. But if the king did choose anywhere in the Yorkshire Walls to visit, everyone in Yorkshire, even everyone in Lancashire, would know that he was visiting here. Would he not? They would. Now, I'm not sure if he would attract more or less attention and adoration than maybe Daniel Craig. The best ever James Bond. Ah. Or Tom Holland. The best ever Spider-Man. Yeah. Or Rihanna. Barbados's best ever export. Um, but my point is that whenever important or famous people come to town, everyone knows about it. You can't hide it. Football stadiums, or are they stadia? That's the plural of stadium, isn't it? Stadia. I just thought I'd put that there. Anyway. Concert halls would sell out months in advance, and even on the day that tickles, uh, tickets are put up, tickles. <laughs> if, <laughs> I'm glad you're listening. <laughs> even on the day that tickets go online, you know, you have to be there, don't you? Because they're gone in five minutes, ten minutes. People want to see the most famous and important. And for A-list movie and pop stars, hundreds if not thousands of adoring and screaming fans will show up hours ahead of time or even camp out day before if you're a Wimbledon fan just to be there, just to see the, these, these people. But when we think about the Christmas story, it shows us that God does things totally different to us mere, fickle and easily impressed human beings. We might even call his way sneaky and underhand because God always uses nobodies of this world, people that society overlooks. And as we approach another Christmas season, the most important person in human history snuck into a town late one night and he definitely didn't stay in a five-star or six-star hotel. And actually, if we're brutally truthful and biologically accurate, Jesus was smuggled into Bethlehem in the womb of a teenage girl who gave birth in the barn part of a poor home. That's not what we expect of the great and the mighty. That's different. And as we approach Christmas again, I want us to look at the story of Christmas slightly differently. The baby, the barn, the shepherds and the magi, we get all of those. But hidden inside that familiar story is a surprising revelation that God's approach and plan is always to ignore the rich and the powerful and the famous. And he chooses to use nobodies like you, like me, instead. Because in the kingdom of God, nobodies are nobody. I want to have a quick look at the nobodies that God used in the miracle of that first Christmas. And right at the end, dig a little bit deeper into our final character. I've already mentioned Mary. She was a teenage girl from a tiny town in a northern outback of Israel. And in ancient times, women were not important people. And teenagers, as we know, even less so. Lower down the social and economic scale. And if we mix into this, her premarital pregnancy, you've got a real nobody on your hands. Who is she? But Mary was God's choice. God chose a nobody. She conceived the baby Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. God considered her somebody even when society called her nobody. She was important enough to bring his one and only son into the world. What about Joseph? Well, Joseph was a nobody. He was just a normal, hard-working bloke engaged to a lovely young woman 
and then his world is turned upside down. How was his world turned upside down? You know the story. Upon finding out that his fiancée was pregnant before they were married, he's faced with a choice between trusting God and protecting his small town reputation from the gossip and hatred that would inevitably follow pe when people found out. What are you up to, Joseph? What have you been doing? Or he could obey God. And actually, reputations belong to important people, something which the rich and the famous spend time and money and lawyers in an effort to cultivate a good image. And most of the important people lived in the big, important cities like Jerusalem. So where's Joseph in all of this? Well, Joseph says yes to shame, yes to embarrassment. He said yes to love and yes to God. God chose Joseph, the nobody, to be the foster father to the saviour of the world. What an incredible man he must have been. An amazing man. Shepherds are not important people. In fact, just the opposite. They're the bottom of society. Failures fit to only work outdoors with animals. And back in that day, watching sheep was reserved for the outcasts of society. People you'd walk past, walk around, or cross the street in order to avoid. And yet, they were the first guests invited to the birth of Jesus. They saw the skies ripped open and heard the song of heaven. Hallelujah. In just one winter's night, these social outcasts, these nobodies, witnessed more of God's glory than all of the priests, all of the Pharisees, all of the religious leaders in Jerusalem put together. Why? Nobody's nobody in God's kingdom. What about our magi, or our wise men? Well, they're nothing more than pagan astrologers. It didn't matter if they had money, they're foreigners. They're not part of us. I joined, <laughs> I joined a, a Facebook group about two weeks ago, and it, it, was, it was something along the lines of, Britain was nicer in the 50s or 60s. Well, I'm unjoined it now. <laughs> I've never seen such racist stuff in my life. I mean, you know, Donald Trump was make America great again. What he actually meant was make America white again. That was his Facebook page. Make Britain white again. It's dreadful. Now, I know, I understand nostalgia. I do get that. I understand that all. And I understand that in some parts of Britain, it doesn't feel like you're living in England. I get that. And multiculturalism, has that worked? Not really. It's less to do with skin colour and more to do with religion, I would suggest. Because when you look at the church, hallelujah, every tribe, tongue, language, race and nation in the kingdom of God. Um, anyway, yes, yeah, so the Magi, the wise men, they're foreigners. They're not even part of Israel. And you know what? Foreigners have the wrong religion. Foreigners have the wrong clothes. Foreigners have the wrong sacred books. And yet, our father invited these rich pagan astrologers, strangers to Israel, to celebrate the birth of the king. Nobody's nobody in God's kingdom. Did those men leave un unchanged? I doubt it. I believe they left very much changed. What about Elizabeth and Zachariah? They're a kindly old couple engaged in harmless religious activity. We hear that regularly. Oh, well, it, it's okay. Oh, bless. Oh, you believe in all that God stuff and you go to church. Well, it's okay for you if you think it's nice and sweet. Off you go. Pat us on the head because it's all a load of rubbish. They don't realize the power they're dealing with. They don't realize the God who they're rejecting. They don't realize the life they could live if they yield to Jesus. We know. So this kindly old couple engaged in relig religious activity, they're the kind of people that society ignores unless they're driving too slow up the highway. I got stuck... Oh, no, I won't go there. All right. 
Where's Ralph? Yeah. Who just says 60? Please, not 30. Anyway, that's another point. Uh, this childless couple found themselves unexpectedly drafted in to care for and raise the greatest prophet of the Old Testament and the forerunner of the Messiah, John the Baptist. Nobody's nobody in God's kingdom. For you of a certain age, and I'm getting there rapidly, God hasn't forgotten us. He hasn't forgotten you. You're not a nobody. You're somebody. And you, you are a somebody because he knows your name. Where's he written your name? In the palm of his hands. He knows you. That's Elizabeth and Zachariah. Anna, lastly, before I dig into a little bit deeper to our final character. Alone and elderly and almost completely invisible in Jerusalem. Anna's there. She's invisible to everyone except the Holy Spirit. And the Spirit of God had been whispering to her for decades that she would witness the most important event in human history. And even after she held the baby Jesus that day in the temple, the world would still have considered her a nobody, a woman at the margins of society. And yet Anna was in on God's secret plan decades before the rest of the world knew what was going on. She was waiting, she was faithful, and she was in the right place where the wind, the Holy Spirit had taken her at the right time. In the kingdom and reign of God, nobody's nobody. Our final person, and I'm just going to spend a little while uh, looking at him. Do you know who I'm going to mention? Almost. I, I did mention him earlier on, actually. Only very briefly. No. Our last nobody is a gentleman called Simeon. Simeon was an individual on the margins of society. He was unnoticed during his day, but he's mentioned briefly in the Bible as an example of how to have a real relationship with God when nobody notices because you are considered nothing special. What's your relationship with God like when nobody but God is watching? I wish mine was better. What's yours like? This is not a judgment. This is just a question. We're fine on a Sunday morning, but what are we like when the chips are down, when we're on our own, when we're under pressure, when we're tired, when we're stressed? What's it like? Simeon was a nobody. And we read in Scripture, just after the birth of their child, in Luke's Gospel, that Mary and Joseph took Jesus to the temple in Jerusalem. Now, I don't know when you visualize a temple, what you think of. This temple, which was Herod the Great's, not his second temple, but the second temple, built by Herod the Great, it didn't compare to the first temple built by Solomon. Nothing. And remember, the Israelites, when they saw it, wept, because it was nothing like the grandeur of the first temple. But nevertheless, it was a massive complex of buildings, a religious marketplace, almost like a huge shopping mall at the very heart of Jewish life. It was huge. So our young nobody couple would have expected to have been totally anonymous when they entered the capital city, amongst the hustle and bustle of humanity flowing in and out of the temple. Nobody's going to know them. Nice when you can, unlike our important people, by the way. I mean, Michael Jackson did his best, didn't he, to go around unnoticed. I think he drew more attention to himself. Very wealthy, famous people couldn't walk down this road before the whispers got, that got out. X is here, you know, you what? who's here, really? I've got to go and have a look. Mary and Joseph, nobody's from up north. Just like nobody's from down south. Sorry, down south. Is that better? But instead, they meet a man who's been patiently waiting into his old age to see God's promise of Messiah fulfilled before he died. Let's read together Luke chapter 2, verses 25 to 32. I'm reading from the NIV, Peter. 
I always like springing this on him just to see how quickly, quick he is. Uh, no, Luke 2, 25 to 32. There we go. Um, and now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout. He was waiting for the consolation of Israel and the Holy Spirit was upon him. I love that term, waiting for the consolation of Israel. Isn't that a beautiful phrase? What does that mean? The fulfillment, what God said he's going to do, the comfort, the peace to come. And the Holy Spirit was upon him. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he'd seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. When the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you've promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace, for my eyes have seen your salvation, which you prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for the glory of your people Israel. Wow. And for the glory of your people Israel. We shouldn't forget that last line. The glory is still there for his people Israel today. Simeon's actions and words are recorded for us, not just as a matter of historical curiosity, but rather to demonstrate how we can enter into God's purposes and plans today as well. Even, I'll say this, even if we feel like a nobody. Simeon had a dynamic relationship with God the Holy Spirit, even before the Holy Spirit had been given to the world. Remember, Jesus had only just been born. He hadn't grown, he hadn't been crucified, he hadn't been resurrected, he hadn't sent the Spirit on all flesh yet. And yet we read here that Simeon, before the crucifixion, before Acts, had a relationship with God. He knew the Holy Spirit. And in just three verses, the work of the Spirit is highlighted three times in this man's life. And each mention points to a distinct aspect of the Spirit's work in the life of Simeon that you and I can learn from today. Even as Spirit-filled believers, we can learn from this amazing man. What can we learn from him? Firstly, we read in verse 25 that the Holy Spirit was upon him. Wow. The Holy Spirit was upon him. Simeon's life was characterized by the presence of the Spirit in a persistent way. To know Simeon, to talk with him, was to taste something of the Holy Spirit. Perhaps you've met people like him. Their lives are permeated with the presence of the Holy Spirit. They radiate the attributes of godly character, like the list of the fruit we find in Galatians chapter 5. Gentleness, peace, patience, long-suffering, goodness, kindness, self-control. This man had them all. And have you met people when you kind of go, wow, uh, they know God. They know God in a far deeper way than I do. I wish I knew God like they did. God is the same, though. He's not withholding himself from us. I think Simeon was like that. He radiated this. And in Simeon's case, other people may not have been able to define the source of his unique character, but they undoubtedly sense the difference. Can we say the same in our lives? Do people say to you, why are you different? What's... What's going on in your life? Even without you telling them that you're a Christian or you go to church. I long for that. Or are we so much like others that people don't see the difference in us? Don't see the Holy Spirit in us? The Holy Spirit was upon Simeon. Secondly, the Holy Spirit has spoken to Simeon personally that he would not die until he'd seen the Lord's Christ. Simeon heard that promise. And this is important because no amount of study of the Old Testament could lead anyone to such a promise. This was personal. So when God speaks to you personally, when you know that you know that you know that you know, that you know, he's spoken to you 
You hang on to it. Don't let anybody else dissuade you. This means when Simeon heard this, he had trained not only his intellect, but also his spirit to receive from God. He combined both the ability to hear and the faith to hold on to what he heard. And I believe he didn't tell anybody. He kept it to himself until the right day. And maybe there are things that the Lord has spoken to you and you're keeping hold of. Because now is not yet the time to speak out. Now is not the, the time for fulfillment. Hang on to them. Don't, I don't know how old he was. Looking at scripture, he appears to be an elderly man. How long had he held on to this for? But he didn't let go. Can you imagine the raised eyebrows he would have encountered if he chose to share such a personal promise of God to others who weren't on the same spiritual wavelength as him? Yet the promise was true because the scriptures assure us so. He would not die until he's seen the Lord's Christ. Thirdly, Simeon followed the leading of the Holy Spirit in practical ways. And we heard that earlier on. The wind blows. The Holy Spirit blows. And he moves us where he wants. Are we listening when he says, go here, do that, do this? Or do we say, no, that's definitely me, not you, Holy Spirit. I'm staying put. He was moved by the Holy Spirit on a particular day to be at a specific place at a precise time, verse 27. He was there where he needed to be. Perhaps Simeon was consciously aware of the Spirit's direction, or perhaps it was something less divine. And you and I can sometimes struggle with that. Occasionally, maybe rarely, we know, we've heard, and we've got to do it. But more often than not, it's a, oh, I'm not sure, is that you, God? I'm going to go in obedience. But whatever level of awareness you and I or Simeon possessed, it was sufficient to put him in the right place at the right time. How many people were in that temple? How many people were in Jerusalem at that time? Tens of thousands probably. How many young couples were there with babies? How did he know? Aside from the Holy Spirit saying, it's them. Do you remember that advert a while ago? I can't remember. And it was a, was that for the lottery? I suppose, oops. <laughs> anyway, you know the finger. Yeah? I don't know how he knew. Apart from the Holy Spirit showing him. Now sometimes God's leading isn't always explicit. In fact, often we can't separate our thoughts from what the Holy Spirit is saying. Maybe until after the fact. How many of you have had this? Well, you've done something in obedience, you weren't really sure, and then later on you look back and go, oh, 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 I oh thank you, Lord. I never knew, but that was you all the way leading me. God will lead us and guide us to a particular point and place if we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying. And as I said earlier on, although we don't know Simeon's age at the time of the encounter with Jesus, the Bible seems to indicate that he was an old man, or an older man. And so his relationship with the Holy Spirit that day was not some sort of automatic control where he had no choice in what he did. It was the result of years of heartfelt seeking and cooperation with the still, small voice so characteristic of God when he speaks into our lives. Do you hear that still small voice regularly when he speaks to you. And when he speaks to you, are you obedient? Like Simeon. Yes, Lord. You, you want me to go to the temple. But right now, well, match of the day is about to start. I'd rather not. Or the rugby zone or the cricket. No. Didn't have the distractions back then. I don't know what their distractions were in terms of their social lives, what they did. No, Lord, you want me to be here. I'm going. I don't know why I'm going, but I'm going. And I'm here, right in the right place at the right time. Simeon's relationship with the Holy Spirit plonked him right in front of the baby Jesus. And Simeon's response to this moment is really, really helpful to us as well. He knew the moment had come. 
the moment that he'd been waiting for. When Simeon announces, dismiss your servant in peace, which is verse 29. He's not being all poetical or, or mushy. He now welcomes death. He says, Lord, you could take me home because you've done what I'd asked. I'm here. I've seen with my own eyes the consolation of Israel. I've seen with my own eyes the faithfulness of God. I've seen with my own eyes the promise of Abraham to Israel and to himself, the Messiah. I've seen him. Simeon saw what others did not see. May we be a people of the Spirit who see what others do not see. Who see what others do not see and act on that. My eyes have seen your salvation, which you've prepared in the sight of all people. I mean, it's an interesting thing. It was normal jogging. You have that phrase up here, normal jogging? Or is that, no? I'll teach it to you. It was normal jogging. That means day-to-day -day business as usual in the temple. Priests and rabbis and religious people of all walks of life strolled right past the King of Glory. How many people walked past Jesus on that day and didn't see him? My brothers and sisters, we need spiritual eyes to see what God is doing in the spiritual realm. So as Ralph said earlier on, we can bring it into the physical as God wills and plans. That's what will change our nation. Now, whether the next government is Labour or not, it's not going to change us. It's not going to change this nation. Oh, by the way, if it's a football analogy, Labour are on the goal line. They've got the ball. There's no goalie. <laughs> can they miss? They've done it before, haven't they? But really, they shouldn't miss. Labour should be the next government. But they won't change the nation. They can't change the nation. They can't deal the, with the issue of sin and salvation. They can't deal with the issue of people's hearts and spirits. Only God can do that. How many people walked past the King of Glory on that day? But Simeon saw a baby and he witnessed the consolation of Israel. And here's the question, and I'm almost done. How often do we walk past what God is trying to show us? Ouch. How often do we walk past what God is trying to show us? Because we're too busy. Everybody in that temple was busy being busy, doing religious stuff. There's an interesting thing. It wasn't necessarily bad. It was religious stuff, and they missed the King of Glory. How many people this Christmas time will miss the King of Glory? And finally, as I close... Simeon, under, Simeon understood that God's purposes stretched beyond Israel to the entire world. He knew what the first disciples missed until God shook them up and removed them from Jerusalem and into Samaria and into the uttermost ends of the world. That's why persecution came, because the first church thought it was still just a, a Jewish thing, an Israeli thing. Simeon knew otherwise. There in the shadow of the temple... Simeon was a witness to the hope of the Gentiles. Now, most of the temple was off limits to women and pagans, but standing before Mary and attracting the attention of Anna, who we mentioned earlier on, Simeon declares that the court of the Gentiles now house the presence of God. The God of Abraham had fulfilled the promise to bless the entire world through a nobody. A nobody. The wonderful message wrapped up in the Christmas story is that God invites the nobodies. And when God invites you to the table, he provides everything that you need. The powerful people, the beautiful people, the rich and the famous might not even make it to that celebration. Now they're welcome, but they might be too busy building their own kingdoms and trying to make themselves somebody. Meanwhile, God's kingdom is filling up with people that no one notices. So this Christmas, if you feel like a nobody, rejoice, because in God's kingdom, nobody's a nobody. Amen.